Good morning, I'm Kumla Dittal. I'm a uh, cardiothoracic and a heart and lung transplant uh, surgeon. Um, born in Italy of Nepalese parents and Nepalese origin. Lived um, most of my life in the UK where I did all my secondary schooling, university schooling, cardiothoracic training and the early part of my consultant positions in heart and lung transplantation where I used to work at Papworth Hospital, now Royal Papworth Hospital in Cambridge where I used to also be the director of the lung transplant program whilst doing heart transplants and mechanical circuitry support system implantations along with a comprehensive cardiac and thoracic work. I uh, then moved to Australia in 2009 um, to be at St Vincent's Hospital where I was continuing on as a cardiothoracic and transplant surgeon and then moved um, in 2018, uh, 2019 beginning to uh, Melbourne where I was the director of the heart and lung program there uh, at the Alfred Hospital. Um, and then have, since then have now moved uh, as of about three months ago to um, Yashoda Hospital in Hyderabad. Currently, everybody's focused on COVID, the immediate impact, and we're pretty much in a war zone with occasional truces and skirmishes, but it looks like we're coming towards the end at least. And that brings on a very different perspective in two ways. One is that COVID, unlike other infections, is causing lingering problems in terms of healthcare to the patients who've been so affected. So you have really three categories, those that seem to recover with very minimal symptoms, some asymptomatically seem to recover, they remain in the community. But for those that have required hospital attention, you have those that with therapy have gone home recovered, you have those who have escalated in their disease status requiring you know, aggressive and complex ICU care, and then have in, re, recovered enough to be discharged home and others in the hospital without a transplant option are often not then surviving. Now for those that have been discharged there is a, something called long COVID and that is becoming the focus of attention in many parts of the world now namely because it's more of a syndrome is that ongoing it's not just the lung damage that continues to dis, dis, cause disability to our patients but it is neurological symptoms, cardiac symptoms, uh, those of joints and muscles, and not least psychiatric issues that are going to enormously impact on family life, societal responsibilities, and healthcare system, uh, I mean, in a very, very major way. So how do we deal with these is then it requires a different way of thinking about the aftermath of the COVID infective episode now we're going through. How do we put in infrastructure policies to adjust and to manage long COVID in the long term? And to that end, the UK has recently announced its intention to create 40 separate, you know, high-end, more holistic long COVID surveillance clinics. Uh, we are expecting the UK National Institute for Clinical Excellence to come out with its guidelines. Similarly, the WHO is expected to be um, coming out with its own policy on COVID management and long COVID. And I'm sure other nations are doing that. I'm unaware of how far that has reached um, in, in, in the Indian Ministry of Health in terms of, or in the state health departments to address this problem in the long term, because we will need a concerted effort. It's not just to be left to individual clinicians to think about their own little domain, but these patients will require a holistic approach to their management in an integrated manner. So we have the data, and in India, given the population, that data will become so valuable, it will help actually India drive the evolution of a much better therapy, because with evidence and data, you can create artificial intelligence algorithms to actually figure out what are the more important aspects of long COVID, which part of the syndrome needs addressing at what stage and what are the outcomes and we would be there to then evolve this and inform others and, and, and smaller nations about how to go and do the best form of management. Okay so COVID has had an enormous impact in all surgical disciplines not least in cardiopulmonary uh, surgery and in cardiothoracic surgery now throughout the western world and including in India there have been many reports and publications um, that are coming on the back of each other, explaining and, and, and detailing uh, the significant reduction in the amount of cardiothoracic surgical procedures, those to the hearts and lungs, that are normally done as elective cases. So many um, institutions have stopped doing the elective cases 
which has the repercussion, unfortunately, that patients then tend to deteriorate at home and they may be then coming to you at a later and more graver situation or that you may, God forbid, lose some patients while they're being, in this way, at least denied that therapy. Now, this has come about because uh, particularly cardiac surgery, more than thoracic surgery, requires high and intensive care uh, facilities. And COVID, in its early and uh, the surge statuses, has really required pretty much um, all men and all women and all beds to be devoted towards the COVID issues. We're beginning to come out and the numbers of routine cardiothoracic work is climbing, which is a good sign. However, this has also had an enormous impact in the extreme end of looking after patients with heart and lung failure, namely in regard to heart and lung transplantation and the implantation of mechanical circuitry support systems, namely artificial heart pumps in those patients with end-stage heart failure. The risk of infection in these patients, particularly the transplant recipients who are on immunosuppression and hence with lowered immunological defense, has been very consciously on everybody's minds and therefore some institutions have put their transplant programs on hold, very fearing the, the repercussion potential of having COVID in the same hospital as where they would be transplanting their recipient patients. However, now we are beginning to see increase in the numbers of transplants, increase in the number of donations, which had again dropped significantly during the COVID time, not least because again, the constraints of intensive care beds. Now, COVID specifically for lungs is going to continue to become a problem. Um, long COVID will have uh, issues with those patients who are below par functionally or who continue to deteriorate in terms of the lung function who may still be post discharge from hospital on oxygen therapy and not recovering and these patients are likely to require a lung transplant and so given the scale of the number of infections globally we are going to see a huge increase in the number of patients requiring lung transplantation to this new indication in healthcare of what we call long COVID or more specifically post-COVID uh, fibrosis as some have wished to call it. So Yeshoda Hospital um, stands apart from many other institutions uh, in, in probably a couple of ways. One in terms of having within its institutions, it's lucky that those are concentrated in the city of Hyderabad providing a substantial number of beds and therefore internally a significant number of donors within its own campus. It is not the discharge from hospital that determines the success. To me, the success only occurs when the recipients have been discharged home and are alive in a good condition up and beyond the time where they would have already passed away from the natural history of their initial medical condition without the intervention having taken place. And therefore, there are certain conditions for which this is achieved within just days or weeks of transplantation and many other conditions where you would have to wait several months um, before you can claim to have done any benefit to that patient, not purely in terms of their uh, prognosis and survivorship, but also in terms of their quality of life.